Well, some of you may have heard of Maggie Eve, some of you may have not. It's been a lot on Twitter a lot these days. I think if there's one thing you need to take away from this presentation is we are taking an extreme approach to what it means to scale a network. We are here to fundamentally unlock new use cases that have not existed before. And in my humble opinion, we are one of the stronger performance unlocks for crypto in recent history. One sec. OK, a bit about our team. We have a pretty strong domain expertise when it comes to low latency computation, high performance networking, and a general vibe, spirit, and technology behind blockchains. Right? Why are we actually here? Elong studied a high throughput, pardon me, Elong actually studied low latency computation at Stanford for his PhD, while Lay studied high throughput networking for his PhD at MIT. For those of you in the know, Lay actually was one of the co-authors of the famous data availability white paper with Shu Yang from Eigenlayer. Shu Yao has been a consensus for six years where she led global business development, overlooking MetaMask, Linea, and Infura. I'm the you know, local DGEN. I've done a wide range of things from investing in infrastructure protocols at Venture, trading liquids at a prop shop, and actually being an operator from organizations ranging from DAOs to uh, companies like Consensus. Our fundamental thesis is similar to many, that layer ones fundamentally cannot scale proportionally to the world compute. The way we receive these conclusions is, however, somewhat different. We think that performance and decentralization are fundamentally quite incompatible, i.e., there's large trade-offs that you need to make to be decentralized. You can see this in the market today. Ethereum is extremely decentralized, right? And because of that, it's not very performant. Solana is a bit less decentralized, right? The nodes are beefier, meaning it's way more performant, and it's just a more active blockchain that can handle more things. Um, that's like a pretty unfortunate truth. For you to be more scalable on the L1, your nodes need to be beefier. It's a conversation that a lot of high-profile ones don't actually want to have. You can think of this best by an analogy, right? Let's say there's a 1,000 students in your class, and you're a teacher. There's some really bright kids, and some kids that are less bright. You have to go at the same speed as the slowest kids to make sure that they understand the content. Blockchains are similar today. They fundamentally throttle so that the slowest participant is not dropped. This is well known as the straggler problem. And that doesn't mean that there aren't optimizations you can do at the L1, right? Monad famously is paralyzing the EVM. Our thesis, though, is when we come to this question, how do we scale to world compute? It's fundamentally impossible on the L1. And that's because we believe that even a modicum of decentralization right, results in massive performance degradation. Our focus, however, is to focus on the last mile scaling bottleneck. And that means execution. We believe that you know, we are performance first. There should be a strong division of labor approach when it comes to layer ones and layer twos. Copy pasted that from Vitalik's uh, blog post from three days ago, by the way. And the way we do that, I will walk into it, end result is 100,000 transactions per second, one millisecond latency. We do this using two techniques. The first is something called node specialization. What we do is we make sure that every single node on our network is heterogeneous. Heterogeneous means that the node does a singular task, while on traditional blockchain architectures, nodes do everything, right? Each node does every single task. That's fundamentally a bit of a problem, right? Because there's a mismatch between the tasks in the blockchain, execution, sequencing, validation, the cohorts of nodes that will run them, and the hardware and software capabilities of those nodes, right? What we do instead is we say, hey, what if we looked at the task itself and figured out, kind of like reverse engineer it, what's the ideal node architecture? So for execution, we should probably have one node that does that, right? That's extremely beefy. For validation, we should have as many nodes to do that because you know, you're validating the network. By doing this, we were able to have specific hardware and software configurations for our architecture. And I think that's best visualized by like our sequencer, right? Highly, highly performant. Uh, and we're able to push a lot of blocks, right? 100,000 transactions per second, sub-millisecond latency by having a really, really performant node. Here you're going to see 
our three different nodes compared to just a traditional market, Ethereum, Solana, and Aptos, you can see for block production, it's really, really intense. 100 core CPU, four memory terabytes, network 10 G gigabytes, you know, it's pretty, pretty strong. And then you can see that's not the case for everyone else, but they can't because you still need to make sure that the, the chain is decentralized on L1, right? You don't want to make it too expensive. However, when it comes to validation, we're also much, much lower than the most decentralized layer one, which is Ethereum. So in some ways, we're actually the most decentralized blockchain when it comes to validation. Yeah, so you know, we have this extremely performant block production, but that's not enough, right? One performant piece of the puzzle will result in bottlenecks showing up in every single other piece of the puzzle. So our answer is we actually need to optimize the entire pie. Here's a basic architecture of how Mega ETH looks. On the sequencer, as mentioned before, we have a highly high-end server, 100 core, 1 TB RAM, 10 gigabyte network, right? But there's additional pieces here, too. On the sequencer, we're able to do, because it's so strong, a variety of optimizations. We do in-memory computing, JIT compiling, parallelization. On the prover architecture, effectively what we do is we have a prover network where each prover node does a subset of the transactions of the sequencer. This architecture is similar or is also known as stateless validation. It allows us to decouple the node requirements of this, uh, that are associated traditionally with the sequencer and make the node extremely cheap. Right? So the goal is for you to eventually be able to run the validation node on the phone. I mean, this is a proof that iPhones are a bit overpriced, but you kind of get what I mean. Uh, traditionally, right, the prover network will then submit proofs to the full node, and now we're onto the full node, right? So the full node also needs further optimizations. If you have such a performance sequencer, right, the full node will have a variety of problems. Traditionally, the, sequence, uh, the full node has had a hard time maintaining the state, all of this information, especially for a, uh, you know, architecture as performant as ours. So what's the solution here? We've actually rewritten the state try. So that's point A. Point B is that we've actually, all of our state deltas slash state diffs are compressed. So by doing this, we're able to optimize the variety of bottlenecks that show up when you have a highly performant block production. As I mentioned before, the result's pretty exciting, right? We have built the first real-time blockchain. 100K transactions per second, sub-millisecond latency. We like to call this instant responsiveness, and one millisecond block times. I think an important conversation to have right now is about like decentralization, right? We've basically told you we're proudly centralizing block production. It's important to note here that this is what we believe is the role of the L2, is you can make these trade-offs that you could not make on L1. So we effectively are able to bake a bunch of security measures that are inherent to L2s to justify the trade-off we've made. A, we have proofs to ensure that the sequencer is following the rules. Initially, we're using optimistic uh, architecture, right? And the reason for this is, truth be told, ZK is still pretty expensive. Obviously, long term, though, that's the plan. Secondly, you have the guaranteed rights of effectively force exiting. If you don't enjoy or you don't like the behavior on an L2, you're able to go back to the L1. It's not ideal, but it works, right? It's a really strong uh, fail case mechanism. Finally, you have freedom of choice, meaning Yes, you have one sequencer that's centralized, but that doesn't mean you can't rotate that sequencer. That's the unlock here. By having one powerful sequencer, you're able to have this level of latency. You're able to have that level of performance, but you can have a rotation of who is the sequencer. So there are three ways we're able to inherit the security and decentralization of Ethereum. Now, why have I come here and talked to you guys about infrastructure when this is clearly a stable coin summit? Well, because we think there's a massive unlock for stable coins and payment systems. This is, in my opinion, a very simple flow of what transactions look like today. It's quite frictionful. To on-ramp transfer and off-ramp, it's at least three transactions involving an on-ramp vendor, including client, and an off-ramp vendor. Tron and Solana have meaningfully lowered the cost associated with payment systems. As a result, you can see that the PayPal Solana integration, when Stripe did their cohort you know, a couple of years ago, almost all of the projects which were part of their cohort were on Solana, because you can actually build more interesting uses of payment on Solana because of the costs. And Tron has found insane product market fit in cross-border uh, transfers, right? All of this is because they've been able to substantially lower the costs associated with these transactions. We believe Megaeve can take this one magnitude further. 
By bringing the cost effectively to zero, it makes it highly viable for gas master models to enable new to consumer businesses. Yeah, so here's three examples, right? In a world where USD transfer goes to zero, we believe that there's a lot of unlocks associated around to consumer applications. There are a couple examples are cross-border transfers. I'm Azerbaijani, like I'm telling you, it would be quite useful. There are entertainment app payment mechanisms. So everyone got into crypto with the idea of, hey, let's try and like decentralize existing like uh, middleman businesses. You can now create really interesting trickle streaming mechanisms. And finally, like factoring businesses as well. It's interesting, right? I think one strong rebuttal can be like, well, the cost is already so low for a transaction on Solana. We believe that the difference between small and effectively zero is massive. And you can think of this similar to Web2, where the cost of data kept decreasing by a factor of 10 every single year. A little bit about how we're going about, <laughs> a little about how we're going a pro, a, I'm not, English is not my first language. A little about how we are going about ecosystem development. It's very targeted, right? We think that this is a phenomenal unlock. And it's very, very exciting. And obviously, I have ideas. Our team has ideas. But some of you might have way better ideas. So we work very, very closely with brilliant, talented builders, founders, devs, on creating applications and use cases that could never exist before. The biggest pain point with Web2, uh, for Web2 users or Web3 is the fact that like, you have to wait. Latency sucks. There's no more latency issues with Mega Eve. What can we build? What kind of experiences can we create? That's why I'm here today, to talk to you guys about these. If there's something you want to build, definitely reach out, and we can work together. We're on a goal to make Ethereum great again. And yeah, this is Megadeth, which had good vibes. Would love to chat with you guys after the call, uh, after this talk. Awesome. That's it from my end, guys.